Random House Audiobooks presents October 1964 by David Halberstam. Read for you by Edwin Newman. October 1964. In the spring of 1964, the young Chicago Cub outfielder, rejoining his team in Arizona, determined that this season he would finally make his breakthrough. It was his third full year in the major leagues, and he was approaching the critical point in his career. The men who ran baseball, he believed, gave you three years to prove yourself. And in his first two years, he had ended up right on the margin. He had not fielded well, and had proved to be only a 250 or 260 singles hitter. To their eyes, that made him at best a journeyman, in an age when baseball teams did not keep black journeymen around on their benches. Still, Lou Brock, child of rural southern sharecroppers, was confident that he had the talent to play in the big leagues. One Chicago sports writer, Bob Smith of the Daily News, had written brutally about his playing. Not always unfairly, Lou Brock later thought. Then, in the 1963 season, Smith blasted, If you have watched all the Cub home games thus far, you probably had come to the conclusion that Lou Brock is the worst outfielder in baseball history. He really isn't, but he hasn't done much to prove it. Some in the press and in the stands considered Brock too casual about his job, but that was a misperception. In fact, he was driven, not merely by desire, but by a rage to succeed. If some people in Chicago thought Brock not motivated enough, his cub roommate Ernie Banks thought him too motivated, to the point that he had lost that most critical of athletic abilities, to relax and just play. Banks had never seen a player so determined or goal-oriented. Brock faced an additional early handicap. The Cubs played him in right field, which in Wrigley Field was the Sun Field, a truly murderous place for young outfielders. Because Brock's minor league career had been so brief, one season in Class C ball in Minnesota, he had never learned how to play a Sun Field. He had arrived in Major League Baseball as a promising rookie, and yet no one had ever taught him how to flip down his sunglasses when a ball went into the sun. Brock had yet another worry as he arrived at spring training that season. The coaches saw him as a leadoff hitter, but, like most hitters, he believed himself a power hitter, for he had hit in the middle of the order in college and in the minor leagues. Suddenly, the whole purpose of each at-bat changed. He was to get on base rather than to drive the ball. He hoped the coaches would not try to mess with him any more, that they would just let him hit. He feared that the Cub management might send him back to the minor leagues for more seasoning. The Yankees arrived at spring training as confident as ever. Their marquee names, Roger Maris, Mickey Mantle, Whitey Ford, still inspired awe and fear among opponents. Most Yankee players, as well as their fans, remained confident about the coming season, which promised to mark the 15th year of a Yankee dynasty that had started with the arrival of Casey Stengel. Since 1949, the team had won the pennant 13 times and the World Series nine times. In those years, the Yankees were a spectacular, finely honed machine. They depended on a deep farm system so skillfully run that when critical parts of the team wore down, new and perhaps even better parts were always found. If, by some chance, the farm system failed to deliver, it was so rich in other parts that a three-for-one trade could be worked out with some hapless have-not franchise. The Yankee players themselves had come to believe in their invincibility. They were not merely the best, they were the toughest players as well. They almost always won the big games, and because they had played in so many big games, they were better prepared for the terrible pressures of a pennant race or a World Series. It was simply part of being a Yankee. Still, 
By this time, there was considerable evidence that the team was wearing down physically. At the end of the coming season, for the first time, Major League Baseball would move to a draft for new players signing their first contracts, a change specifically designed by other owners to limit the huge bonuses being paid to untried green players, thereby weakening the power of both the Yankees and the Dodgers. In addition, by 1964, the Yankee farm system was not the majestic organization that had existed at the beginning of the dynasty, for it had been severely cut back because of economic constraints. There was one great new talent pool, that of young black players, but it was well known that the Yankees had moved slowly in this direction. Sure of their success, sure of their past, and sure of their own racial prejudices, they had essentially sat on the sidelines in the 50s as a number of National League teams had signed the best of these young, supremely gifted, and determined athletes. In fact, most astute baseball observers believe now that the entire American League was inferior to the National League because it had lagged in signing black players. The owners even began to suspect that this difference in the talent was showing up in the attendance figures and that the American League was in trouble in part because the Yankees had dominated it for a generation, and in part because the National League players were far more exciting. There were already tangible signs that the Yankees were in the early stages of their decline. They had beaten the Giants by the narrowest of margins in the great seven-game World Series in 1962, a series decided only on the last out. Then in 1963, the Los Angeles Dodgers powered primarily by two great pitchers, Drysdale and Koufax, had swept the Yankees in four games. Though the Yankees appeared to have a number of talented young pitchers just beginning to come into their own, they had not yet come up with a single sure big game winner to replace Whitey Ford, who was, by the spring of 1964, already 37 years old and increasingly dependent upon his shrewdness and courage. In his first 13 World Series decisions, Ford had been 9-4. and four. In his last four, he was 1-3. and three. In the spring of 1964, there were other signs that the team was wearing down. Jerry Coleman, the former Yankee second baseman, by then a broadcaster, was struck as he watched spring training that this was somehow not as tough and as disciplined a team as he had witnessed in the past he thought a different kind of player was beginning to come up. In the past, the Yankees had always signed the toughest kids, often for less money than they were offered elsewhere. For many of them, and Coleman had felt this way himself, being a Yankee was almost a religion. Now, Coleman thought, the younger players were not so singularly focused on baseball as those of his generation had been. Going out for dinner with his broadcasting partner, Red Barber, Coleman said, you know, Red, I don't think the Yankees are going to win it this year. And Barber answered, I think you're right. The center of attention at the Yankee camp was the new manager, who was in fact the old catcher, Yogi Berra. The Yankee front office was in a state of flux. In 1960, general manager George Weiss, the efficient, if not entirely likable, architect of much of the previous decade's Yankee success, had been told by his employers that his services were no longer needed. Roy Hamey had come over from Milwaukee and briefly replaced Weiss, a fleeting moment when there was a good deal more interest in signing black players. But Hamey soon wanted out, and Ralph Houck was promoted to general manager after the 1963 season. Houck had managed the Yankees for the previous three seasons and had won the pennant all three times. Houck was known as a player's manager, which meant that he could not have been more different in his approach from Casey Stengel, whom he had replaced. Not only did Stengel show little personal interest in his players, except for what they might do for him on the field, he seemed loath even to learn their names. Born in 1889, Stengel came from an era in American life when very little emphasis was placed on being nice or kind to employees, and he was in fact rarely kind or nice to his players. Stengel had his eye not merely on winning pennants, which he certainly wanted to do, but on history as well. And as far as his players were concerned, he seemed to be interested chiefly in courting writers. 
As far as Stengel was concerned, the writers were the critical link to history, and in return for his attentions, they glorified his professional skills. Ralph Haug changed that overnight. His loyalty was to the players. He was an extremely political man, and he had a shrewd sense of the mood in the clubhouse and the resentments that had festered under Stengel despite all those years of winning. Hauk was very much aware that Mantle had come to resent Stengel's thinly veiled criticisms, which tended to show up in the stories of various New York writers. The relationship between Mantle and Stengel had evolved over the years. Stengel had been a mediocre ball player himself, and for much of his career he had managed ball players even more mediocre than he had been. When he finally got the Yankee job late in his career, Stengel had eagerly anticipated the chance to mold Mantle, to add to that magnificent body a mind filled with all the baseball knowledge and lore he had accumulated over four decades. Mantle, as the sports writer Milton Gross wrote at the time, was to be the monument the old gent wanted to leave behind. But Mantle frustrated him. He remained pure Mantle, not a hybrid of mantle Stengel. It was then that Stengel tried to reach him by criticism, often meted out by the sports writers. There was already enough pressure on Mantle as it was, the pressure of playing in New York, the pressure of replacing the great DiMaggio, and above all, the pressure of living up to his father's, Mutt Mantle's, high expectations for him. To some degree, Stengel's attitude colored the attitude not only of the New York writers, but of the New York fans as well. The glory that should so readily have been Mantle's, the acclamation by the New York fans of his greatness and of his ability to carry the team year after year, came only after a decade of play and only when Roger Maris challenged him in the 1961 home run derby. Then the fans somehow decided that it was Mantle's prerogative to challenge Ruth's record, not Maris's. Only then did they begin to cheer Mantle as they jeered Maris. Hearing them boo Maris, Mantle noted with some degree of amusement, Roger has stolen my fans. Ralph Houck knew this was Mantle's team, and the first thing he did as manager was to go to the center fielder and tell him what he knew, that Mantle was the leader of the team and therefore now the captain of it. That moment symbolized a significant change. Houck would cater almost exclusively to the players, often at the expense of the writers, whom he did not so much shun as treat as unnecessary evil. No one appreciated that more than Mantle. The Hauk years were largely happy ones for the players and frequently less happy for the writers. Hauk had been an average ball player himself, a backup catcher during the Berra years. Hauk constantly told each player how good he was, how critical he was to the team's success, no matter how small his role. Hauk's replacement as manager was a surprise to the team and to the media, Yogi Berra, the longtime star catcher. Berra was chosen, it was believed by those who knew the front office well, partly to compete with the upstart team in the New York area, the Mets, who were now managed by none other than the indefatigable Charles Dillon Stengel, soon to be 75. The combination of the Mets' virtually pristine incompetence and Stengel's singular charm made the Mets a major draw. The Mets were perceived as inept but lovable by a new generation of fans, while the Yankees were coming to be seen as the athletic equivalent of General Motors or U.S. Steel. In 1963, Yankee attendance slipped again, the second year in a row in which that had happened. In a somewhat misguided effort to become more popular, the Yankees decided to make Yogi Berra their manager. Over the years, the New York media had viewed Berra as something of a cartoon figure. Funny, awkward, but lovable. Much given to inelegant, but ultimately wise aphorisms. Some of the famous yogiisms were genuine, but a good many were manufactured by the writers. And the real Yogi Berra was quite different from the one that had been invented by the press. As a player... Yogi had been surprisingly quick and nimble in a body that did not look particularly athletic, and he was a very dangerous late-inning hitter. His new assignment was going to be difficult. He was replacing a popular manager, Ralph Houck, now the general manager, who was still close to the players and who was now his boss. 
Moreover, he was going to be managing his former teammates, who respected him as a player, but who had frequently joked about him. When his friend and teammate Mickey Mantle was asked how the team would do now that Berra had replaced Hauk, Mantle answered, I think we can win in spite of it. That spring, Bing Devine knew his job was on the line. He had been general manager of the Cardinals since 1957, but he had not yet produced a pennant winner, and Cardinals owner Gussie Bush was hardly the most patient of men. Bush was the Budweiser tycoon, accustomed to having his every whim fulfilled. Since he was immensely successful in the beer business, he assumed that he would be equally successful in the world of baseball, about which he knew almost nothing. Bush was an extroverted, zestful man, a booze and broads kind of guy, in the words of Harry Carey, the team's announcer, and a close pal of Bush's. Bush was a generous man, albeit generous on his own terms. He did not like to be alone, and he tended to be followed by an entourage of cronies. It was the rare Bush crony who did not believe in his heart that he was a baseball expert. Therefore, being a baseball manager or a general manager for Gussie Bush was a high-risk occupation. Every day of August Bush's life, Bing Devine thought ruefully years later, there had to be any number of people telling him, Hey, Gussie, you made a winner out of Bud. How come you can't make a winner out of the cards? At the tail end of the 1963 season, the Cardinals had launched a furious, if belated, drive for the pennant, winning 19 of 20 games, and that had whetted everyone's appetite for what was going to happen in 1964. Whether the 1964 team was as good as it had been in that miraculous, almost flawless three-week stretch was by no means a certainty. Devine had spent his entire life in the Cardinal organization, apprenticing from the bottom up, and there was no job so insignificant that he had not performed it. He was, therefore, an expert on how a seemingly unbeatable team could unravel almost overnight based on an injury or two. He knew how two star players could have unexpectedly bad seasons at the same time and cripple a team, and he knew how the combination of these, an injury and an individual bad season, could end a team's chance as a pennant contender. Devine was well aware that Bush was not a baseball man, but a sportsman accustomed to winning. The Cardinals' previous owner, Sam Breeden, had come to baseball after owning an auto dealership in St. Louis during the years when Branch Rickey was the general manager. Breeden was, if anything, cheaper than Rickey, a legendary skinflint. With Rickey gone to Brooklyn as general manager, the Cardinals still managed to win regularly throughout the 40s. But... Getting older and fighting cancer, Breeden began in the mid-40s to sell or trade many of the team's better ball players. Breeden also allowed Branch Rickey's great farm system, which in the 30s and 40s had fed so many great players into the team, to atrophy. The last hurrah for the old Cardinals came in 1949 when they dueled the Dodgers in a momentous pennant race. Up two games with only five games to play, they blew that lead at the end. The era of the Cooper brothers, Whitey Kurowski, Terry Moore, and Howie Pollitt was over. Soon only Musial and Shane Deanst remained from the glory years. A decade after Bush purchased the team, Bing Devine still had his job as general manager cut out for him. To rebuild the farm system on a smaller scale in a new and more expensive era while trying to jumpstart the existing club. Bush was still looking for his first pennant. Bush realized that baseball was an effective and relatively inexpensive advertising vehicle for beer, and it was not entirely by accident that Bud's resurgence as the nation's best-selling beer coincided with the brewery's purchase of the Cardinals in 1953. He seemed to have little patience for watching his own team play, and his interest quickly waned during the games. To manage his team, he tended to hire small, feisty overachievers, men who were considered strict disciplinarians. Two of his first three managers, Eddie Stanky, whom he liked, and Solly Hemus, were cut from that cloth. Their very manner seemed to promise the owner that they would keep his young athletes in line. Stanky, Hemus, and Fred Hutchinson, who served a tour as manager in the 50s, 
had grown up in a tougher, harsher America or had apprenticed under men who had. They were not always supple in dealing with younger men who often had greater natural gifts than those once possessed by their managers. The Depression was a thing of the past. The country was dramatically more affluent than it had been, and such gifted athletes as Ray Sadecki, Tim McCarver, and Mel Stottlemyre often had other options in life. As for the black players, treating them with a harsh authoritarian hand had even more ominous implications and was likely to produce even less positive results, as Sally Hemus's handling of Bob Gibson and other players would soon show. Young baseball players, white or black, could no longer be treated as if they were recruits at a marine drill camp. In the past, a manager intimidated his players. Stanky was the prototype of that kind. Stanky knew a great deal about baseball and later turned out to be an exceptional scout and a valuable instructor within the Cardinal organization. But he was having trouble adjusting to a changing America. Hemus, the third of Bush's managers, saw himself as a Stanky disciple. Like Stanky, he was a prisoner of his own baseball experience, and he seemed to lack the capacity to treat different players in different ways. His blunt manner and words especially bothered some of the black players, who considered him racist. In 1956, after some 20 years in the Cardinal organization and six years as general manager of its AAA team in Rochester, Bing Devine was brought back to St. Louis having been told that he was now going to be named general manager of the big league club. But a man named Taylor Spink, editor of the Sporting News, a baseball weekly published in St. Louis, suggested to the owner that he hire Frank Lane, a professional baseball man known for his propensity to trade players. Unfortunately, Lane was a man who traded not so much to build a better team, but almost out of a psychological need an irresistible impulse driving him to move around players. Lane became known as Trader Lane. It was also true that the more important a ball player was to the team, the more seemingly inviolable his position within the Cardinals, the more irresistible was Frank Lane's urge to trade him. Thus, Red Shandings, the great Cardinal second baseman, and a cherished link to the glory years of the 40s, was dispatched for Alvin Dark. And the only reason that Lane did not trade Stan Musial, who was to most Cardinals fans the living embodiment of the team, was that Musial's restaurant partner learned of a proposed trade and managed to go public with it just in time, thereby stopping Lane. From then on, all major trades had to be cleared with Gussie Bush. Lane was soon gone to Cleveland, where, among other things, he was noted for trading away the young, talented Roger Maris to Kansas City, before Maris could reach his full potential. It would have been hard to find a better human being in baseball at that time or a man more grounded in all its aspects than Bing Devine. When Devine took over from Lane, he envisioned a certain kind of baseball team and traded systematically for it. He wanted speed, good defense, and above all, balance. Within months of taking over from Lane, Devine began the process of building the team that would come together in the mid-60s. His first important decision was not to trade a player, a young third baseman outfielder named Ken Boyer, who had come up through the Cardinal organization. As far as Devine was concerned, Boyer would be the keystone of the next generation. He had played both infield and outfield in his first three seasons, and there were signs that he might be a budding star. The Phillies made a strong offer for Boyer. They offered Richie Ashburn, a talented, speedy center fielder. Boyer was an adequate center fielder, but Devine suspected he was out of position there. What distinguished him was not so much his speed as the quickness of his reflexes, a vital trait at third base. Having a third baseman who could field and who also added power to the lineup gave a team an edge. But that meant Devine went to the winter meetings at Colorado Springs in December 1957 without a center fielder. It was part of the culture of baseball that you were supposed to leave those meetings with someone new, so that at the very least the fans would be optimistic about the coming season. On the last night of the meeting, Gabe Paul of the Reds sought out Divine. Look, you haven't made a trade and we haven't made a trade. Let's skip the dinner and sit down and make one. So they met in Gabe Paul's room. Late in the session, one of the Reds' officials suggested trading Kurt Flood, 
a young black outfielder in their minor league system, to the Cardinals. Flood had the potential to be a great player. He was not yet 20. He had played two full seasons in the minor leagues, and he had excelled both years. He was a good hitter, a good fielder, and a tough kid who had withstood a lot of pressure in a hostile environment. The Cardinals were offering one undistinguished big league pitcher and two minor league pitchers for Flood. Bolstered by his manager, Fred Hutchinson, Devine made his first deal. The Reds were willing to make the trade, virtually giving Flood away, because they already had Frank Robinson as a budding star in their outfield and because Veda Pinson was a potential star in their farm system. Flood himself always suspected that they were not enamored of having an outfield of three black players. For their part, the Reds lost the chance to have an outfield of Veda Pinson, Frank Robinson, and Kurt Flood. Slowly and steadily, Devine continued to put together the right kind of team. As the team began to emerge in the early 60s, almost everyone on the team could run, including two power hitters, Bill White and Ken Boyer. But then, in 1962, there was a dangerous move against Devine. A man named Bob Cobb, who ran the Brown Derby restaurant in Los Angeles and who had, in the days before expansion, run Los Angeles' AAA club, spent an evening with Bush and suggested that Bush get the greatest baseball man of all time to help run his club, or at the very least, to advise him. So it was that 58 years after he first began as a player in St. Louis, 50 years after he first managed a big league team, and 38 years after he first became general manager of the Cardinals, Branch Rickey returned to St. Louis, principally, it seemed, at the expense of being divine. Ricky joined the organization with the title of special consultant to Gussie Bush, and from the start, he set out to take over the team. Ricky was then in his 80s, and his health was beginning to fail. Branch Ricky was arguably the single most important front office figure in modern baseball history. He had helped create the idea of the modern farm organization. His courage and foresight in challenging baseball's policy of segregation and in sensing Jackie Robinson's greatness guaranteed him a place in America's history books. But by reputation, he was, in the words of Leo DeRocher, one of the men who managed for him, the worst operator in professional baseball, the cheapest, the shrewdest, and the most hard-hearted of men. The ability to get something for as little as possible was a trademark of his technique, and even when he signed Robinson, he had not deigned to pay the Kansas City Monarchs anything for Robinson's contract. He wore Devine down, making him argue harder for trades, which meant that if Devine finally got a trade, the expectations on the part of the owner were higher. In the fall of 1962, Devine decided that St. Louis badly needed a solid veteran shortstop. Otherwise, the infield was strong. Ken Boyer at third and Bill White at first were virtual all-stars, and Julian Javier at second was young, but showing certain signs of greatness. Devine wanted a mature shortstop to play alongside Javier and help bring him along. Dick Grote, only two years earlier, the most valuable player in the National League, was available, the Pirates having become disenchanted with him. Grote was an unusual player. No one in any major professional sport was ever a better illustration of the difference between being fast and being quick. In terms of leg speed, Dick Grote was slow, but in terms of his reflexes, he was exceptionally quick. He had been a college All-American as a basketball player and a professional basketball player as well. He had great hand-to-eye coordination and deft hands. He was also an exceptional hitter, almost always around 300. He had great bat control rarely struck out, and was very good on the hit and run. He had been a professional shortstop for 11 years, counting time spent in the service, and had never played in the minor leagues. At the time that Devine wanted to make the trade, Grote was 32 but still had several good seasons ahead of him. But Ricky hated the deal. Stanky, the Cardinal scout, Harry Walker, a coach, and Johnny Keane, by then the manager, all wanted it. But Ricky kept stonewalling it. So one day, during the instructional meeting, they all descended on Ricky. You seem to have this meeting loaded, Ricky said to Devine, and he was not pleased. Yes, Devine answered, he had loaded it up, but they all wanted Grote that badly. 
All right, Ricky said. I will tell Mr. Bush that I won't stand in the way of this deal, but I won't recommend it either. Mercifully, they bet right. Grote decided that he would throw from shortstop overhand, much like an outfielder, instead of a sidearm, like most infielders. In 1963, he made a solid challenge for the National League batting title at the end of the season, and that summer, all four Cardinal infielders started in the All-Star game. But, if anything, Ricky became even more resentful when the Grote deal worked out, and in the spring of 1964, there was one more incident which showed that Devine was dealing from a base of limited power. Tim McCarver was set in spring training as everyday catcher, but Johnny Keene badly wanted a new backup catcher. A young player named Bob Euchre, of limited experience, playing behind Del Crandall, Ed Bailey, and now Joe Torre at Milwaukee, was available having told the Milwaukee management that if he was not traded, he would retire from baseball. Keene wanted to make the deal for him, giving up two minor players, Gary Kolb and Jimmy Coker, then the backup catchers. Ricky resisted, with a vehemence out of all proportion to the importance of the players at stake. Finally, just as the team was about to leave Florida, Keene went to Devine one last time to ask for Euchre. I'm sorry, Johnny, Devine said. I've gone as far as I can go on that one. Keene could, if he wanted to, Devine suggested, go out and talk to Gussie Bush at his home. Around midnight, a call came for Devine from Keene. He had talked to Bush, and it was okay to make the Euchre trade. Bing Devine knew that time was running out on him that year. Just before the Cardinals broke camp, Johnny Keene sat talking with a group of sports writers about how evenly balanced the National League was and how important a great player like Sandy Koufax of the Dodgers became in that situation. Koufax, he thought, had stood between the Cardinals and the pennant in 1963, and he was concerned that that one pitcher would once again make the difference. No team had great hitting and great pitching, and no team since the Milwaukee Braves in 1957 and 58 had won back-to-back -back pennants. The team that made it through was likely to be the one with the fewest injuries to key players, Keen said. The signing of Yankee players usually took place relatively painlessly, or at least relatively quickly. Management still held all the cards at contract time and retained all the negotiating leverage. Mantle had signed again for $100,000 and Maris for $65,000. But Jim Bulldog Boughton, who had pitched extremely well in 1963, winning 21 and losing only 7, with an earned run average of 2.53, was asking for virtually a 100% raise for his third season. In 1963, he had made 10,500, and now he wanted 20,000. Hauk was offering 18,000, and that was as high as he was going to go, he told the press. Boughton finally conceded. As far as the Yankee management was concerned, Boughton's near holdout typified the danger of letting a young player, particularly a pitcher, have too good a season too early in his career. Boughton that spring did not realize the degree to which he had violated Yankee tradition. As Boughton neared his 20th win, Hauk had not kept him out of the rotation. But years later, something clicked in his memory. He remembered the game that was his 20th win. It had been in Minnesota, and he had been backed by a lineup that was weird, a goodly number of the scrubinis, as the bench players were known, with some of them out of position. Phil Linz, for example, in center field, and Johnny Blanchard in right. But Boughton had won his 20th, and then for good measure, he won his 21st. There was a sense among the other players that Boughton was entitled to more money, that somehow he was different. He was part of the new breed who had joined the Yankee roster in recent years. Their style puzzled the old-time players. Boughton, Phil Linz, and Joe Pepitone were considered distinctly un-Yankee-like in temperament. Their sin was in being lighter of heart than most Yankees and of not taking defeat quite as hard as their predecessors did. Later, some traditionalists claimed that the Yankee decline began with the arrival of the newcomers, that they had not understood the Yankee tradition of seriousness and commitment. However, while it was true that Pepitone squandered as much talent as any player who ever wore pinstripes, it is also true that no one played harder than Boughton or Linz. The new breed players were not deferential to the veteran players. From the start, they talked to the senior players, the great stars of the team, as if they were equals. 
Pepitone in particular ignored the team hierarchy. If the normally unapproachable DiMaggio walked into the locker room, it was Pepitone who might yell out, Hey, Clipper, how are you? Do you want to have dinner tonight? To everyone's amazement, this seemed to please DiMaggio. It quickly became clear that Pepitone loved Mantle, loved being Mantle's pal and basking in the reflected glory. Pepitone loved it when Mantle nicknamed him Pepinose. Stengel, in those days before ethnic slurs were taboo, called him Pepperoni, and was thrilled when Mantle told a sports writer that Pepitone was the key to the 1963 season. A figure we'll win by a nose, Mantle said. Yet even the easygoing Mantle, a player always looking to be amused, thought there were times when Pepitone overstepped the bounds. The Yankee roster was essentially set when spring training began. There was, the players believed, one additional place left. Yogi Berra was looking for a reliever, and in early spring it came down to a contest between a player named Tom Metcalf and one named Pete Mickelson. By all odds, Metcalf, then 23, was the favorite, for he had gone further and accomplished significantly more than Mickelson, 24, whose career had been rocky. Metcalf had been brought up to New York from the AAA Farm Club in Richmond in mid-1963 when Houck began to worry about his bullpen. Because he had spent time with the parent club, it did not occur to him until rather late in the spring of 64 that he was competing with a pitcher who had never pitched above Class A. Even Pete Mickelson himself thought the fact that he had been invited to the Major League camp something of a fluke. He did not have a very good fastball, and he did not have a very good curve. He did have a wicked palm ball, a pitch that allowed him to rear back and throw with a violent arm motion while the ball itself proceeded slowly toward the plate. In much of his career in the minors, he had been on the edge of failure. To make bad matters worse, in 1963 he hurt his arm at the start of the season. Because of the pain, Mickelson had been forced to start throwing his fastball with a shoulder-high delivery instead of a straight overhand delivery as he had in the past. When he began to do that, the ball started to sink on the hitters, and they regularly beat the ball into the ground. Rube Walker, Mickelson's manager in Class A, spotted the sinker and told him to stay with it. Don't change a damn thing. Mickelson later said, Metcalf was a prospect and I was a suspect, but Barra had liked sinker ball pitchers in the past because they could come in during tense situations and get the batter to hit the ball on the ground. As the competition continued, some players told Pete Mickelson that he was doing well, but he did not believe them. But then the day came when he pitched against the Minnesota Twins, and he looked up at the plate to see the immense figure of Harmon Killebrew facing him. Here was the man believed by most players to be the only other hitter in the American League as strong as Mantle. Harmon Killebrew at bat, Mickelson thought. I must be getting closer to the major leagues than I ever imagined if I'm pitching to him. He gave Killebrew nothing but sinkers, and Killebrew drove four of them into the ground foul. Mickelson still believed that he was going to be sent back to a minor league camp, although at a higher level, when Rube Walker called him over. You're going with the big club, the Yankees. Tom Metcalf was called in by Yogi Berra and told that he was being sent back to Richmond. That spring, having apparently learned a lesson in Florida, he began to work on a sinker ball. During one inning, he tried to throw a sinker and felt a small, sharp pain in his elbow. He had damaged the nerve in his right or throwing elbow. Though he made one major attempt to come back in 1965, his career was essentially finished, and he never made it back to the major leagues. When a few years later, Marvin Miller, the labor negotiator, visited the various baseball camps during spring training to explain collective bargaining to players for the first time, he was struck by the fact that the Cardinal camp was different from every other one he visited. The players were more relaxed, more mature, and better integrated, black with white. The friendships among the players seemed to transcend racial lines, and Miller was especially struck by the fact that not only were the players friendly with each other, their families were too. By the summer of 1964, the question of race hung heavily over the nation at large, and baseball, too, was going through its own period of dramatic racial change. It was now 17 years since Jackie Robinson had broken in with the Dodgers. 
In the years since Robinson's historic arrival in the big leagues, some teams had moved quickly to sign up the best black players. It was the equivalent of a bargain basement sale at Tiffany's. The talent search was not joined with equal enthusiasm by the two major leagues. In the American League, the tone was set by the New York Yankees. They were winning and winning consistently without black players, about whom the ownership believed many of the existing stereotypes, that blacks were lazy and would not play well under pressure. George Weiss told reporters he did not even want white rabble at his ballpark. He wanted his fans to be from the white middle class. Ironically, Mantle's greatness increased the arrogance of the front office, for his exceptional speed and power convinced the Yankees that they did not need to change. As most of the other American League teams followed suit, the National League gradually began to pull away a superior, with better teams and more exciting younger players. By 1964, the National League had virtually all the best young black players, and it was therefore a league with more speed and power. The American League tended to rely on sluggers, Mantle was the rare exception, and its players tended toward a slower, more cautious game, its managers by and large waiting for the big inning. The difference between the leagues was dramatic. After the 1963 season, Sandy Koufax, who had dominated the league as well as the Yankees during the World Series, was the National League's most valuable player. The selection followed a decade in which nine of the previous ten winners were black, and in the one instance when a white player won, Dick Grote of the Pirates in 1960, it could easily have been his teammate Roberto Clemente. If, by 1964, the Cardinals had become something of a model in terms of their racial composition and attitudes, it had not always been that way. In fact, the Cardinals had come to this more slowly than most National League teams. They were one of the teams that had, for a brief time, considered striking against Jackie Robinson in his first season. Before the Dodgers and Giants moved west in 1958, and before Big League Baseball went to Atlanta, St. Louis was not only the farthest west team in professional baseball, it was the most southern as well. St. Louis was for a time the most segregated city in the big leagues, the city that visiting black players liked to visit least. The Chase Hotel, where the ball club stayed, was one of the last to admit black players. The regional pull of the surrounding territory affected the cardinal decision-making, and the team drew some of its players and many of its fans from the South and Southwest, so it was loath to violate their racial prejudices.